Well, good morning, everybody. For those online, we are, uh, as always, grateful that you've joined us. For those who are here in the auditorium and making their way in, we're also grateful that you're here. And it's my privilege just to welcome you this morning to Bridge Bible Church Shores Campus. Um, a couple things I wanted to mention very briefly. Number one, thank you so much for uh, scores of you who were praying. It was a great encouragement to me last week to be sitting in quarantine in Costa Rica, watching the service here, including uh, dying a thousand deaths because I couldn't hear the King's Brass live. That's always a fun time for me. But then at the end of the service, uh, that you as a body just uh, took a moment to pray for us. Um, for those of you who don't know, we were in Costa Rica seeing our newest granddaughter, Marin, who's uh, six weeks old this week, and helping out with her and having a great few days, and Marsha came down with COVID. So we put her in a room, I fed her through a hole, and she did fine. <laughs> No, all jokes aside, uh, we quarantined, we were very careful, and uh, thank the Lord, she uh, was symptomatic only for a few days, got through her time, and then has been able to extend her stay, so she's still helping with our granddaughter. Uh, I was able to come back early, thankfully get an get a early flight, but we're very, very grateful for that. Thank you for praying for us. Um, thank you for praying for the young people. I understand they've had a really great week working in Kentucky at the Kentucky Mountain Mission. And they're on their way back now as we speak, so uh, as you think of it, pray that God would uh, provide them safety and rest as they get back. And if you happen to see either the Kramers or the Starts, today is the 40th and 41st anniversary, uh, respectively, so wish those couples congratulations. And then I just wanted to say that as we continue our study of Jonah, I thought about a New Testament verse that really fits the theme of where we're headed today in the first few verses of chapter 4, and I wanted to share it with you as a call to worship. From Titus chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes these words, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now I invite you to stand with me, and in that spirit, let's lift our voices as we worship together in song. Let's lift our praise this morning.
morning, church. It's so great to be here with you guys this morning. I'm so glad to be back. I've been up north for a couple weekends in a row. Um, so it's just good to see faces and, and say hello and be worshiping with you guys this morning. Um, I don't know about you. I had a bit of a rocky week. I had some ups and downs this week. Um, and I am just, I'm, I've been reflecting all week and especially this morning about how thankful I am that we have the Holy Spirit, that we have him always. He's in us. He's with us always. And so when I have weeks that are up and down and I, I don't know what, what's the right decision, what's the right thing to do, um, I can just be quiet and I want to lean into what the Holy Spirit is leading, right? He will lead us. He will give wisdom. He will show up because he's with us always. And so just being obedient to, to the, the leanings of the Holy Spirit and, and saying, yes, okay, it's not what I want, it's not what I thought was going to happen, but I will be obedient in this. Um, I'm just encouraged by that this morning. So as we continue to worship, uh, just hold that tightly, hold on that we have the Holy Spirit always in us, with us, going before us.
and take a seat. My usual thing is... Uh... Well, good morning. Uh, I'm glad you're here this morning, those of you online. Uh, we're going to jump back into Jonah, so if you want to turn to Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4... We're going to dig into this. Uh, we have four more messages left in Jonah. Um, I'm going to take this passage and take two weeks on it. I'd like to take more. We're going to do two weeks on it. Then Cameron's going to have uh, the, the, almost the remainder, and then I'm going to sum it up at the end of the month. But uh, if you're visiting, we're, we're trying to dig into this, this person of Jonah and this book he wrote to his own people as to what he was trying to say to them. For those of you who are unfamiliar with it, Jonah was given this command to go to this nation of Assyria, to their capital city, uh, Nineveh, and to present to them, in essence, God's grace. Uh, obviously, reluctantly, he does not go, gets swallowed by a big fish, gets spit out on the ground, we get all that. He ends up there, 
and then he does some prophet sabotage. Instead of being vibrant in his message delivery and engaging and whatever, all we hear is, Nineveh, in 40 days you'll be destroyed. Five words in the Hebrew, eight in the English, and he is done. He all of a sudden must have seen repentance, and he has a response. So the first thing I'm going to ask you before we start is what is your response when good things happen to bad people? What is your response? I'm not asking for an actual statement, but what is your response? How do you feel in your heart, in your attitude? And then I'll just elevate it one more. How do you feel about when good things happen to a bad person who has hurt you? What is your emotion? What do you feel like? We're about to get a glimpse, I think, I'm not going to put you in this position, but I'm going to put myself in this position, I'm about to look into the mirror when I look at Jonah's life. God's word says it's like a mirror to us, reflecting, and I hope you don't see yourself in this story, I really don't, and I'm not going to pretend that, or I'm not going to assume that everybody will see themselves in this. I know I saw myself in this story and in this response. And I want you to think about it, and there's a reason I have to break it up in two messages, and I'll share with that as we go along. But here's the passage that we're going to take a look at. Again, Jonah was sent to Nineveh, and he preached, and God started doing a work, and it says, if you're reading through that, that he was displeased and was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is this not the very reason that I did not want to go to this place? I did not want to go there because I knew, I knew what you would do. You are a God. And then he quotes a passage out of Exodus 34, which is in the Old Testament, one of the most, I think it's the most quoted section. Um, It's like a John 3.16 passage in the Old Testament. This is how... To the, to the Israel people, this passage was paramount into, into their life. For I knew that you were a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting of disaster. Now therefore, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord was said, do you do well to be angry? Or what? The Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Or, do you do well to be angry? I have no idea how he said it. We have no nuance in the Hebrew about what it means. All I know is God confronted him with his anger. And if you take a look, later on in verse 9, and and Cameron, I'm going to jump just a little bit into your world. Just sorry about this. He's going to be really worried about what I'm going to do today. Um, God does something really great for Jonah, and then Something bad happens with Jonah, and he he says it again. Do you well? Do you do well to be angry? Now, if if this was, I I do a whole eight hour thing on anger, so this is like, I can't wait to do this. I'm actually going to show you a couple slides I show to people in my my leadership stuff I do. But what I often do is this I will have everybody stand. We're not going to do this because I know this would be really awkward for you all. I have everybody stand, and I say, Very, 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 very hot, 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 rage anger on this side of the room. Never been angry on your life on this side of the room. I'm going to have you stand, we're not going to do this. I'm going to have you stand up and just line up in the back of the room so I can see who I'm working with. Now, where do you think people go? Nobody ever goes over there because I said, you've never been angry in, once in your entire life. I've never had anybody in all the times I've do this ever go to the far side. They mostly go where? Right in the middle, which I think is pretty cool, which means I'm working with a group of people who've never been angry like Jonah has been angry because this says he was exceedingly angry. This is hot, vehement anger, throw something. Anybody put their fist through a wall before? I knew I was going to be the only one who had this confession. 
When I was in the army, my first wife and I had a little thing. I didn't know I had it in me, and I put my fist right through a wall. That cost a lot of things. <laughs> and I realized I had an anger issue, and I had to start dealing with it very, very fast. And part of what I'm going to share with you probably comes out of this. Um, have you, nobody's been hot, 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 angry where you've thrown anything. You don't have to confess, but am I the only fool here? Okay, so let me go into this a little bit. This is really cool. Jonah is having a problem. This is not just a bad week. Jonah is having a bad roller coaster ride. He is angry and he quickly slips into suicidal thoughts. He then gets something that is given to him by God, and it says the same word, exceedingly glad. <laughs> okay, now let me just stop here. Have any of you ever gone from anger to happiness? Oh my gosh, I don't even know where I'm to start here. Look, at th this guy is having an emotional moment because then he's going to go right back into his suicidal thoughts. So I said, we're looking into a mirror, and... I might be the only one looking at it, but take a look at, I want you to see what happens here with this guy. This is not a good moment in a person's life. He is having a tremendously hard time. So the reason he's angry is because back in chapter 10, we read what was happening, or ch chapter 3 and verse 10. And what we don't understand is if anger happens for a little bit of a time, it's only missing one word to make it a real problem of danger or one letter it's 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 a it's a problem and I don't know where you're at on your anger spectrum but I want you to see something that's very very important out of this text I think we should take a look at Jonah's mindset was all messed up because he saw that God redeeming the Ninevites was a bad thing and in your own mind you would say how can that even be what does that look like? I, I could never think that way. So I'm going to split this into two messages. The first one is this. We're going to talk about really what was the narrative in his mind and what did it do. That's what we're going to do. I feel really bad because I'm not going to give you much solution today. I'm going to present a problem. You're going to have to come back next week to hear the solution because the solution is what was... What was the problem with his thinking? So I want to focus on this concept of thinking just for a minute, okay? So again, let me pull you into the world of emotion just a minute. Um, emotion has a lot to do, you're going to, and all the research kind of bears this out, even not, not, not biblical Christianity research, but uh, pure humanistic uh, psychology research will, will bear this out. And I'm going to read a couple things, to, or read something to you to, for you to see this. Um, emo our emotions are, are co controlled by how we think and how what we believe, okay? So whether you're happy or whether you're sad has a lot to do with how you think and how you what we call frame things. So let's suppose your child comes in and says, Mom, I'm, Dad, I'm getting married. And you frame that as a really cool thing. You get all of a sudden in your life, something happens, and it begins to release certain types of chemicals. It, it, there's all types of chemicals, and, and the physi I could get some of you doctors to talk about where these are generated from, but they get released in your body based on what your mindset does. That's what, that's what we know, how you think. So let's say you go, oh my gosh, you're getting married. That is so wonderful. All of a sudden, you start feeling what? Happy, unless you're the father and you have to pay for it, or because the father of the bride, you know what I mean? You have to pay for it. And then you, at the wedding, you start to cry and someone looks at you and said, oh, you're crying because you're so happy that she's getting married. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. But let's suppose you're like, you're getting married? You're getting married to him? Oh, are you kidding me? All of a sudden, what happens? What emotion starts to come? Angst, frustration, worry. At the wedding, you start to cry. And people go, oh, you're crying because you're happy. Nope, I'm crying because she's marrying the bum. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? This is, there, there is no debating this kind of formula of what happens. I want you to understand that. And I am talking about pure emotion. So what happens in our emotional state 
is controlled. Almost all of the, the things you see there, all those chemicals, if you, if you read a lot about them, they'll, st they'll start going back to how do you focus? What do you think about will determine that. So I'm going to read to you. You have to follow along. I was going to put it up there, but it's too long. I'm just going to read it. You kind of hear it. This is not for, I do not know the spiritual condition of the, the three people that wrote this, this research. But every time I read it, people kind of get the point of why we need to understand something about anger and why it's dangerous to, in our lives. Anger, per, anger, perhaps, is one of the most powerful and complex of all human emotions. According to one researcher, it is a basic level or a prototypical emotion category which occupies a central importance in the mapping of all human emotions. I would also add fear is there. Fear and anger are the two that I think I work with the most when I'm dealing with people. And I deal with people every day who uh, have unresolved anger issues. Every day. So this is a study of mine for a long time. And this is, I, I love how this states. While the intensity of anger may vary from one person to another, anger itself is, supra -individual, is a supra-individual entity which exist in every human being in different measures. In psychoneurological terms, two researchers have described anger as a psychobiological or in a subjective experience that is frequently accompanied by auto autonomic nervous system arousal. This is going to get a little complicated, but watch where they go with it. Which manipulates perceived realities through cognitive, how we think, distortions and deficiencies, and affecting social constructed reinforced scripts. More specifically, anger negates our humanness and subconsciously transports the angry person. Oh, hold on. It just disappeared. Don't do that to me. More specifically, angry, anger negates our, negates our humanness and subconsciously transports the angry person to the dark region of, region of unconscious repression where the remaining dormant animal self is forcefully brought back to life. In this excited phase, anger directly breaks through our fenced self, the civilities of our charming personalities, conditioned temperaments, cultured inhibitions, and transforms, transforms one into an animal-like entity with facial, vocal, and other bodily changes that individually take one back to the borderland of savagery and insanity. I don't know if that's true or not. All I know is when we get angry, we look really bad. And what they're saying is that the complexity of anger, when it comes into our lives, changes our behavior in such a way we almost look animalistic. I deal with people every day who are having that issue. This is a very serious thing for everybody in life. I would maintain, and I don't want to get too broad with this in this statement, but the majority of what we're seeing in our country today is the fact that people don't know what to do with anger. And they have unresolved anger and anger over wrong things. So, let me give you something that I think will help. I want to give you five things about anger, okay? About the narrative here that we have. Jonah's false narrative created anger in his heart. I need you to understand it because next week we're going to talk about that false narrative, where it came from. Because when he quoted Exodus 34, he quoted part of it and he left a piece off that I think he was holding on to in his head. And we'll get back to that. Here's the thing I need you to see. When it displeased him, it began to produce this anger peace in him. So how would you feel if a person that, you, that hurt you had a picture framed on the walls of their house of how they did you wrong? Seriously. And they told you about it. Would that not just cause, how many of you could just pass by that? So this is a hall in the British Museum. On the side of the hall, I lost a little thing. On the side of the hall, you see those little tablets? Those are actually pieces 
that they took from the king's palace when they excavated Nineveh, and they saw these pictures in the king's primary hall. Now, for those of you who might have difficulty with horrible things, you might want to look away or look down and not take a look at this. I'm going to show you two pictures of what the king of Nineveh had up on his walls to, com to memorialize the actual um, destruction of an Isra a Jewish town uh, back in 2 Chronicles, okay? So take a look here. If you, if you can't get the picture, what they're doing is they're beginning to skin people alive. This is Jonah's family. They went back and memorialized the victory. This picture off on the side is what they're doing with these bodies. This is a chronicled event in 2 Chronicles. This is an, a historical event. There is no disputing this. Jonah is sent to give them good news. God saves them. And it makes Jonah angry. Now, again, this may not be you. Praise God for you. But when this hits your body and you start framing in your mind something that's based on a wrong belief structure, as I think Jonah did, it will produce an immense amount of anger in your life. Now, I do think we have to, and I'm going to just do this briefly, we have to answer the question, well, what if somebody really does do me wrong? Do I have a right to be angry? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands in that. Normally in my work sessions when I do this, I ask, is there ever a right for you to be angry? Everybody raises their hand. I have never been in a group, and I've done this for 30 years, never had someone not raise their hand. I look for someone who think, who, does, who would say, nope, it's never right to be angry. I just want to show you something. I want to show you something from God's Word and have you just think through it. First of all, we need to understand this. I'm going to give you five sub-points to point one here, okay? God himself fear, feels anger. There's, this is just one passage. I'm pulling one passage out for each of these. There's multiple passages that I could bring up for you. But he feels indignation every day. That's God himself. You got that? Christ felt angry. Uh, in this particular passage, he wanted to heal someone's hand, withered hand, and he got angry because the Pharisees didn't want him to do it on the Sabbath, and he was angry and grieved at the hardness of their heart. So we know that the Father and we know the Son gets angry. Um, again, another, he felt everything we felt, but notice what it says yet without sin. The spirit gets angry. We can actually make the spirit angry. We can grieve the spirit of God by our, our lack of obedience, or our lack of sensitivity. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit get angry. Now we'll notice what this says. And I, I, I put can in parentheses. According to Paul, it says be angry and what? Do not sin. And then it says, if you could possibly, by the way, I would say if you can possibly do that, anger with not sin, if you could do that, don't let the sun go down on your anger because if not, if you do, you will give opportunity to Satan, to the devil to do work in your life. So the question you have to ask yourself is, Paul saying to me that yes, I can be angry as long as I do not sin in it. And I... I think it's pretty simple. That's what he says. The question is, can you not sin in it? And then I come to this passage. And remember, Paul and James always have this little bit of a debate in their mindset about some things, and we always have to try to figure out what they both are trying to say. But notice what this says. Is it possible for man to be angry and work the righteousness of God?
Hmm. It's pretty simple. No. No. So how do, we, how do we work through this with our anger? This is where I really hate what we're doing because I'd rather have you stay for an extra hour and we'll just go to that answer, but I'm going to answer that next week. Because I, I think the way you're angry without sinning, I think God has actually given us an answer and we're going to do that next week. Does that sound okay? Those of you who are planning on being away, I hope you get to watch it somehow. But you need to see that. I'm, I know what I'm creating here is a problem. I don't like to leave you not with a solution. But there is a solution to this to resolve that. I will tell you this. I don't think you and I can have anger and work the righteousness of God. We have to figure out what to do with that anger. And God gives us a way to do with it, and he actually shows us how to do it. And I think that's what Paul was saying. The bottom line here, folks, is that we will be displeased and exceedingly angry if the narrative in our head is not correct about these things. In fact, anger can cause displeasure in life. And I would even go this far. You can't be angry and also have the joy of the Spirit in your life. I'm working with some people right now where they are just purely angry. Angry at the world, angry at circumstances, angry at situation, angry at each other. They're just angry. And believe me, I have been there. I went 10 years with anger with the guy, the, the man who molested me. 10 years it took me to figure out this lesson that I'm trying to give to you in a short little moment. It took me time. I had to sit down with someone and work through it. It literally took away all my pleasure in life because I was consumed by it. I'm reminded of uh, Nelson Mandela's quote, and I wouldn't say, I'm not trying to prop him up, but I love his quote. Me being angry at you is like me drinking poison hoping you'll die. And that's exactly what I think scripture teaches us about anger. If you're here today with anger, it will rob your joy. And you have to figure out something to do with it. And don't get me wrong, there's things that have been evilly done to people that you are holding anger, and I get that 100%. Let me go to the second one. Jonah's anger caused him to make poor decisions about his life and his life purpose. Um, this is what made him go to Tarshish. Now, we, we knew this because we had the whole story, right? But the Israelites reading this didn't have that until they got to chapter 4. We understand that. He made a bad decision. So I'll just ask you this. Has anybody ever been frustrated? Because, by the way, frustration, um, angst, um, I'm trying to think of another nice little word, unsettled, all are just roots of anger, okay? If you study emotion, there's, there's two extremes. And for when you study emotion, there's what's called an emotional wheel. There's eight emotions on this wheel. Anger is one of them. Love is one of them. There's eight on this wheel. There's another wheel that was just created. I think the guy came up with 32,000 different emotions. So somewhere between there, <laughs> eight, eight and 32,000, what we would say is that there's about eight, seven, eight basic emotions that make the other ones come. So frustration is just a form of anger, but a lighter mesh, part of it. Have any of you ever made a bad decision because you've been in the wrong state of mind with anger in your heart? Don't raise your hand. That's what he's taught. That's what he's saying. He's confessing to God, this is exactly why I went, because I knew exactly what you would do, and I'm angry about it that you would do that. That's an amazing thing. Anger can cause bad decisions in, in what we do in our life. And you can go back over your life and look at some of your decisions and ask, have I made that decision with some sort of anger or frustration or even rage in my life. That is what he's talking about here. Jonah disobeyed God and went the other way. And that decision cost those sailors, it cost, it cost Jonah, it cost the whale, oh, sorry, the fish, it cost everybody because he made a bad decision. And he did it out of anger. You can't have anger and make choices centered on God's will. Later, you can take a look at these passages in Proverbs, but if you ever want to do a really cool study, read through Proverbs. Today is the 7th, so read Proverbs chapter 7. Tomorrow, read Proverbs chapter 8. Just do that. I've been doing that for almost, 
almost my entire life, every day I read whatever proverb it is, and every time I read through it, I pick out a theme that I want to study. So go through Proverbs once and just pick out anything that says about anger, and you're going to find out that Solomon wanted to tell us about anger, and Proverbs is about wisdom and folly, wisdom and folly, and anger is on the folly side. So understand that. If you're in a state of anger, and I don't care where you're at on the spectrum of the anger, you will make foolish decisions, and you will not make godly decisions in wisdom. So be careful about that. Number three, Jonah's anger caused his theology to be muddled. He only saw the Ninevites as an enemy. He only saw them as an enemy and not as a redeemable people for God. Is it possible for you and I in our minds to see people as unredeemable Our political world today is rampant with this, that we see the other side as unredeemable. His theology was so messed up, and again, we're going to jump into this next week, but he knew, he knew what God would do, and yet he could not, in his mindset, change that narrative in his head. Anger can give you dissonance in your belief structure. It can cause you to start believing something you never would have ever believed in your entire life. This to me is fundamental. I work with a lot of people who are having belief structure problems. They're believing something that is incredibly poor. And they can't get their mindset wrapped around a good, solid belief structure. And I'm not even talking about believers. When I talk to believers who are struggling with these kind of things, I understand because I was in that world. My gosh, my whole belief structure changed. It was so clouded. Let me just say, you can't have anger and fully know God in the way he desires. I thought you were going to read this passage this morning when you said to start off. You did you did First Timothy 1. I thought you were going to read this one. I thought that would have been so, not, not that you, I missed it or you missed it, but we were not in harmony. This is so cool. You know what it says? Brothers, let's lift up our holy hands in worship to God and put away anger. Do you realize it doesn't matter how well you sang this morning, that if you're here this morning and you're harboring some kind of anger in your heart, it was cutting off your ability to worship and know God in a personal way. We're about to launch a whole series in September, I can't wait, on knowing God. Not just knowing about Him, but knowing Him. And this passage right here just bears this out, why it's so important for us to get our theology correct and and understand who God really is. But if you're holding anger in your heart towards a child, towards a parent, towards a spouse, towards a, a, a near relative, towards a boss, towards a community, if you're holding anger in your heart, it's going to mess up your ability to know God in a personal way. And there's more scripture than 1 Timothy 2.8 to show you that. So when I went through this spot in my life, I could not have explained a thing about God. I was so dissonant in my head about who he was. Four, God's anger caused him to lose his motivation for living. I want to jump into this because next week I'm going to handle this real a lot. You could say that Jonah was having, at this moment in time, what? How would you describe what he's having? What words would you use? Crisis? Depression? A breakdown? He was having a mental health episode. We may be through COVID, but the mental health episodes have just begun. I just did a whole series two weeks ago, a whole session on how do you identify people who are in emotional stress having a mental health breakdown. If I come here this morning with a broken arm, you would say what? David, what happened? (laughs) If I came here in a wheelchair, you would say, David, what happened? If I come in here and I walk with my head down and sit down, probably nobody will say anything. You caught me this morning, young lady, You remember what you said to me? You asked me how I was, and what did I say? I said, good. 
Now, does anybody know what she said after that? Not perfect? Because I always say perfect, and I'm like, I'm perfectly tired. <laughs> We've been doing triplet duty, like, like stay up in the middle of the night type stuff, get up really, really early. Those little buggers, they don't know how to sleep yet. So you, can, you want to pray about something, pray about that. You caught it because my habit of saying, when you say, how are you? I say, perfect. You were sense. I, I appreciate that. And you said, whoa, wait a minute. Do you, are we that, I love that, by the way, thank you. Are we that sensitive that when someone comes into the building without an, or their arm in a cast or in a wheelchair and their facial expressions look like there's a problem that you and I as believers are tied in to wonder, is there anything I can do to get them support? By the way, and I wouldn't use the word, can I help you? Because you probably can't. Don't use that. Don't go up and say, can I help you? Because now you've just obligated to do something that you cannot do. But rather, can I get you help? Is there any help that we can find for you? Do you have any support? I'm telling you how serious this is. Next week, I'm going to talk about four people who are depressed and want to take their life in the Bible. And we're going to talk a little bit about the mental health part of this. Because it's a big deal. Joan, I love what you talked about, Tim, about the PTSD part for Jonah coming out of the fish. What, cramped little space, no food, picking off whatever was there. I mean, this guy has gone through an emotion. You can, you can laugh, and I think we should laugh at chapter 4 because, my goodness, are you kidding me, dude? But at the same time, you might be there someday. And this guy is going through a mental health crisis. He cries out in prayer. And he says, God, just take my life. Probably the majority of you have never said that to God. Probably. Praise God for you. Bless your hearts. I do know there are some in this room. I know I've prayed that prayer in the middle of a depress depression. And it is nothing to laugh about. The interesting thing, I noted, I, I sent an email to you about this, Cameron. I was meditating over this. I think it was this week or last week. I can't remember when I said that to you. Notice what he does. His theology is all messed up. But who is he appealing to to take his life? God. You know what? <laughs> he still believes in the sovereignty of God. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, God is now in charge. With the Ninevites, no. <laughs> With me, yes. Do you see what's happening? I go back to the previous point. The dissonance in his head is really weird. He is like, I knew you would be like this. Now just take my life. You shouldn't have done that, God, but you can take my life. Believe me, our arguments with God sometimes in the middle of these states can be just horrible. Habakkuk is a wonderful, wonderful book where he starts out and saying, God, why on earth are you using these Babylonians and these Assyrians to come after us? Why would you use evil people to come after such great people? And the whole book of Habakkuk is these kind of things. Understand, folks, that when you're in this moment of life, it can anger can lead to depression. I am not saying that every depression is a result of anger. In fact, I'll show you next week in these other examples, there was something else that led to their depression. Four biblical characters that something totally different was. But in this case, in this case, his anger, his unresolved anger, his failure to give that anger to God in the right way caused him to be so depressed he wanted to take his life. You can't have anger and the peace of God at the same time. And it's the peace of God that gives us life. Christ said, I've come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. I've come to give you peace. And we can't have that when we're shutting it off because we're angry about something that God has done or hasn't done the way we like. Jonah's anger caused him to be confronted by God. I love this. <laughs> And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Notice, I told you there's a bunch of prayers in, in Jonah. Chapter 1, the, the, the sailors prayed. Let us be innocent of this blood. In chapter 2, Jonah prayed in the fish, get me out of here. In chapter 3, the king of Nineveh prayed, give us repentance. In chapter 4, Jonah prays and says, take my life. 
And so God, oh my gosh, that's a prayer. You realize that's a prayer? It's a bad prayer, but he's at least turning to the God who can help him. He said, God, please take my life. And God says, well, do you do well to be angry? And what does he do? Puts up the hand because the face ain't listening. <laughs> and he walks away. Is that amazing? Have, have you ever been deep in prayer, praying for God, and all of a sudden God confronts you with something in your life, and suddenly you're going to go sit down and find a tree to sit under and just sit there. I'll let Cameron handle that piece. Is that amazing what he does? He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't keep the engagement. God right now wants to engage. And God wants to engage us with our anger. Do you do well to be angry is a question we should ask. Isn't it? Okay, spouses, I'm going to give you a little cool thing here to do. Okay. And by the way, I actually say this, what I'm about to say, to groups of people. I have no idea if they're saved or not saved, but when we're doing the angry, I say this. If you're leading someone or you're working with someone and you sense that they're getting angry, look them square in the face and say, is it okay for you to be angry right now? Is that not a good... Some of you are laughing. Do you know what people will do? They will get more angry. <laughs> they will not confront the anger. Why don't we want to confront the anger? Come next week and I'll try to answer that question for you. I think it's because we don't know how to confront the anger. And so we have to help them. And so we have to have more than just, is, are you, is it okay for you to be angry right now? We clean that up a little bit and we might say, is, you're being angry right now. Is that something you want to do? Because this is going to lead to something. And we kind of coach people through that. Does that make sense? Next time your spouse gets angry, just try that. Just see what happens. Then call me up. <laughs> Anger can cause discipline by God. Because that's what he's about to do. God's about to bring discipline into his life. And by the way, removing peace from him was God take, starting to do the discipline. He could not find peace because he was angry at God. You can't be angry in God and enjoy the fruit of God's discipline. Hebrews 12, 11 says that no anger seems good. Or sorry, no discipline seems good at the moment. But it, is, it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. When we allow God to come into our lives. If you're dealing with some anger in your life, my suggestion to you is let God ask you the question, do you do well to be angry? And there's some answers you can give God. And then let him discipline you and let him bring you back to where you, you need to be and have peace with God. What can, we, uh, can happen when we're angry? You realize that? It literally says, Cain got angry. John, 1 John tells us, why did he get angry? Because of his envy. So there's a connection to another emotion. He was envious of what God did with Abel, and he, he didn't like it, and he got angry and killed his brother. Moses got so angry that he threw the tablets down and broke them, and then later he got so angry at the nation of Israel, instead of speaking to the rock, he hit the rock with a stick, with his, with his staff, and God said, because of that, you can't go into the promised land because of a moment of anger. He lost the promised land. Isn't that amazing? David became so angry when God killed Uzzah when he touched the ark that David literally abandoned the ark of God, or the ark of the covenant. He literally abandoned it because of his anger at God for what God had done. Failed to understand something about God. Rachel said, I can't get pregnant. I want you to have sexual relationships with my servant. And Jacob got so angry at her that he did. And you know the rest of that story. A whole nation rose out of that that would be in conflict with Israel for the rest of their lives. All out of anger. Do I do well to be angry? No. No. Do you do well to be angry? If you're angry, there's a reason and that re there's a way in order to solve that anger and that's what we're going to try to get into the next time for the solution. Anger can cause a lot of bad things. 
It can take away your pleasure. It can mess up your whole decision-making. It can give you a, a, a belief structure that's totally messed up. It can cause depression. It can cause God, and it will bring God's discipline into your life. Big idea is this, if you want to come up. Ungodly anger will destroy our lives. It will destroy our lives in the very purpose that God has for us. It will impact your physical body and cause you to do facial, vocal, and physiological changes to your life to where you will almost start looking and feeling animalistic. And if you haven't seen that, bless your hearts, I hope your rest of your life keeps going that way. But if you've ever been with someone who's angry like that, you'll see that those fits of rages started off with one small little frustration that built and built and built and built and was never resolved by a proper belief system in who God is. And next week, we're going to figure out how to solve that. Okay? Bow your heads with me if you would, please. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's so practical to us. Thank you that you give us this example of this man who went through a moment of rage in his life to such a point that he despaired of his very life. Father, I make no claims of, of being able to have conquered this completely in my life, but I thank you for the deliverance that you've, in the parts that you've been able to give me in my own anger to circumstances around me. I pray for this body, for those who are listening online, that if they have anger struggles, that they would allow you to speak into their life that do we do well to be angry. To, to, contr to get to the part of anger where we realize it's not producing the righteousness of God and to be able to put it away in the right way and not let the sun go down on, on our wrath. Father, I pray that you would help our body to be able to understand this truth that you allowed this man to go through in order for us to learn. In your son's name we pray, amen. All right, will you stand with us as we uh, close our service today with uh, some more worship?
We are so thankful to be yours. We're thankful to go into this week with your blessing, bringing the Holy Spirit anywhere we go into any situation. God, we're thankful to be yours, and we worship you this morning. Amen.